Now that we've introduced probability, let's look at some rules that we can use. So the first rule I've listed here is the addition rule. And one of the things I want to make sure is clear here, some of this um, notation. So I would read this as the probability of A or B. And we're saying that's equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Uh, set notion notation wise, this is called union of A and B, and this is called um, the intersection. And just to be clear, when we talk about the probability of A or B, that's accounting for the possibility that only A occurs, or only B occurs, or that they both occur. And the probability of A and B means that both A and B must occur. So one way to kind of envision this, what's happening here, is to think of what we call a Venn diagram. So if I consider this rectangular region to represent all possible outcomes, and then you can envision these circles as representing the outcomes that correspond to A and to B. When we talk about the um, probability of A or B, to be clear, what that represents in this visual here would be anything that sits inside of either circle. So what's happening here is this is saying that we're going to take everything, whoops, uh, let's go back, take everything in A that's here, and we're going to add to it everything in B. And then the potential problem that we see here uh, let's see what's another color I can use, is that um, this part here gets double counted if you add everything in A to everything in B. So we subtract it once so that it's only counted once. A common mistake is people forget to subtract the intersection, and that would only make sense if you had these two circles or events that didn't overlap. So one thing we can do at this point is just look back at something we finished with in the previous video. And that was our example where we rolled a uh, four-sided die twice. And then what we looked at was the probability of what we can now think of as a union. So if I let A equal um, that you roll at least one A, then we can think about the outcomes that correspond to that. That would be A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, B, A, C, A, and D, A. So the probability of that would be seven out of 16. And then if we let B be the event that you roll at least one letter B, and then we think about finding the probability of B, again, I can list out those outcomes. That would include uh, B, A, B, 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 C, and B, D, but also A, B, C, B, and uh, D, B. And we get that the probability there is 7 sixteenths. Well, notice that if I wanted to use this formula that we just wrote down, we should get that it's the probability of A plus the probability of B, whoops, minus the intersection. So what we want to think about here 
is that the intersection would actually be including these two things. So the probability of the intersection is 2 over 16, and we get 12 over 16. So for reference, you can look back to our example and see that's exactly what we computed just by brute force listing out every single outcome that sits in both. And this is also useful if we already come into a problem knowing um, some of these pieces here, probability of A, of B, and of the intersection. Another useful rule is the complement rule. And this one might be a little bit easier for us to see here. Again, think of what this looks like visually. Here, I'm just going to draw one event because we don't have to consider the interaction with another. So first of all, when I write this A with a superscript of C, we read that as A complement, and that basically means not A. So every outcome that is not included in A. So um, to be clear here, A complement would be everything out here. So we would be referring to everything outside of the circle that still sits within my sample space. Okay, so this is a complement. Now, what's really key here is we have to look back to our rules from probability. And the rules from probability said that if you add all possible outcomes together, the probability should be one. Uh, so the idea is that if I add probability of A and the probability of A complement, well, according to our probability rules, that includes all possible whoops, outcomes. So that would have to be one. And then certainly I can rearrange those to get this formula. This can be particularly useful in calculating um, potentially complicated uh, probabilities. So again, if we think back to the example where we had, we rolled a four-sided die twice, one thing we looked at was the probability that you roll at least one A uh, or at least one B. So this is the one we just looked at above. So if I think about at least one A or at least one B, Another thing we could think about is that the complement there should be um, the probability that we roll no A and no B. And that's a little bit easier to count. Um, The only way there's no A and no B is when we have C, 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 D, D, C, D, D. So one minus four out of 16, again, ends up at that same final answer. So this is just different ways that we can approach the same question. And like I said, in particular examples, you might be more inclined to use a particular rule if it cuts down on how long it takes you to get to your answer. Another thing we want to talk about here is a new definition. This corresponds to a relationship between events A and B. We're going to say that these events are independent if the probability of A and B is equal to the product of the probability of A and the probability of B. So this is our mathematical definition. So anytime you encounter a problem that refers to independence or asks you to check independence, you always need to be able to come back to this equation. So let's look at an example where we flip a fair coin twice. So first of all, just to be clear, fair here means that, again, the two faces are equally likely. We'll see some problems that mention a biased coin. And in those instances, you have to be told what the probability is of flipping a particular side. But here we're going to think of it as uh, one half on each. And then I've defined here three different events. So one thing to look at, we've talked about rolling a die. If I think of flipping a coin, 
the outcomes are words, right? Heads, tails. One kind of nice shorthand is to replace heads with just H and tails with T. Then I can see that my outcomes for flipping this twice could be heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, and tails, tails. So there are four possible outcomes. Now that I've listed that, let's think about which outcomes correspond to each of my events. So A, if the first toss is heads, is going to be heads, heads, or heads, tails. For event B, this would be heads, heads, tails, heads. And for event C, this would include just the one outcome, heads, heads. So by listing these out right away, I can find the corresponding probabilities. So the probability of A is one half, the probability of B is one half, and the probability of C is one fourth. So now let's consider if any pair of these is independent. Um, in particular, what if we looked at um, A and B? The probability of A intersect B is, that's saying what's the probability that the first coin lands heads and the second one lands heads? Well, if you look at my outcome space, that's saying what's the probability that we get heads heads, and that's gonna be one fourth. And that also happens to equal the product of the probability of A and the pro uh, probability of B. So this would be a way for me to confirm that A and B are independent. If instead I look at say A and C, the probability of A and C is likewise the probability that you see heads heads. That's the only outcome that satisfies both of those. But notice that yes, that's one fourth, but that is not equal to one half times one fourth. So this formula fails. This is a way for me to confirm that A and C are not independent. This can also be said that A and C are dependent. And so here we see, again, this uh, necessary equation in order for us to make this claim of independence. Uh, this will happen or be of use in a couple different ways. Like I said, that you want to use this if you ever need to verify independence. But on the other hand, you will encounter situations where you're told that you can assume independence. And in that instance, you can uh, assume that this holds true. And then the last thing I'll say here is that there are many times that we kind of take for granted independence. So for instance, here I assumed that my coin tosses are independent. Um, so if you roll a coin or roll a die or flip a coin, anything like that, it is natural to assume that what you see on one roll or one flip is not gonna have any effect on what you see on the second. And so a lot of times we do take that for granted there are other situations where it's not clear if that's the case, and we can always check with our formula to see if in fact we do have independence.